I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Well, hello, and uh, welcome to the Leaves of Glen Mansion. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion uh, and not just recording in my basement. This is where uh, where I read the hottest in public domain books and short stories. Uh, this week, we're going to continue to read Castle of Terror by Caroline Farr, a gothic novel first published in August of 1975. Uh, about the author, well, uh, most of the titles for Horowitz's publication Gothic series were written between 1966 and 1977 by, quote, Caroline Farr, unquote, a pseudonym of Australian writer Richard Wilkes Hunter, uh, though other writers were known to have used the Caroline Farr house name. Not going to keep uh, laboring that point, but I love the idea of a house name. Uh, that's pretty much all you know about the author, because it's... Uh, Apparently, Richard Wilkes Hunter, Dick, uh, didn't really have anything uh, out there about his life, so we're never going to know. Uh, so I decided to look up other authors throughout history who were jerks. Uh, this week, we're going to learn about Bram Stoker. Uh, he is the father of the modern vampire, and he's the most famous for Dracula, uh, obviously. But he was also a massive conspiracy theorist. Oh, also, I got this from uh, grunge.com. So they try really hard to write real cool and hip, trying to take facts about authors and make them fun for the average teen, apparently, because they use cool lingo. Uh, and he was absolutely convinced England's most famous queen was both an imposter and a man. Casting a wide net, Stoker wrote famous imposters to detail his beliefs. And it starts with a reference to some mysterious secret mentioned in, in, in various historical accounts of Elizabeth's rule. Stoker says the secret is that uh, the real Elizabeth died in childhood. Oh, and when her, when her governess was confronted with the task of telling her father, she decided to, well, not. Uh, thinking the better course of action was to just uh, substitute in a, a new kid. And she found that the only uh, appropriately aged one in the vicinity was a young boy. Burp. Henry was a busy guy. Glance at the child confirmed that, yes, it's a kid, and moved on. The rest of Elizabeth's life, uh, from her role as the virgin queen to her preference for the heavy clothing and makeup that disguised her, was carefully concocted to hide the truth. That Stoker absolutely believed it, a belief fortified by rumors that the young prince's body had actually been found some time in the 19th century, was reburied, and kickstarted the tradition of dressing a boy in Elizabethan drag around May Day. Via history answers, it's in parentheses, rumors still circulate today. So thanks, Mr. Stoker, for being weirdly concerned about what's under that dress. I didn't say that. That's from uh, supercoolgrunge.com. Still got time before the clock. Damn it. I thought that one could uh, last for a while and that I wouldn't have anything to say about my personal life. What is there to say about my personal life? Uh, I had a happy hour with coworkers recently, and uh, everyone had a lot of jokes about the fact that I have five cats in my house. Five cats. That's a lot of cats and a dog. So my house is so full of hair that we have to vacuum pretty much every other day. Uh, and all the cats have decided that one of the three kitty litter, uh, kitty litter boxes around the house, only one is worth taking a crap in. So uh, they all crap in that. And man, if you miss a day of cleaning that thing out, it's giant tectonic plates of piss that you're pulling up out of that thing and stick it to a bag. Uh, it's disgusting. I've had flecks of it fly into my eyes. So I've actually had granulars of uh, kitty litter with urine-soaked granulars just fly into my eye. And then I scream uh, like a like some sort of uh, squid. I don't know what kind of a high-pitched 
a squeal would sound like, what kind of animal creates that, maybe a giraffe, I don't know, they have long necks, that uh, I, I get up and then I have to wash my hands first, and then I gotta wash out my eyes, it's just this, this entire bizarre scenario, and I hate it. Oh, thank God. Well, with that, why don't we dive into our story. Well, there you are, getting all settled here in the uh, master library. I don't know. This this mansion bit has run its course, and I'm running out of steam with it. Uh, what happened in the last chapter? I don't remember. Almost nothing has happened in this book. But at the same time, small movements have been made in the story. I just can't remember, because it's just full of so much fluff. Uh, we're only three chapters away from being done with this thing, so I have no idea when the hell this is actually going to get scary for real. So, here we go with chapter seven. <laughs> I lay awake listening for the sound of Shane coming home in Oliver's sports car. Oh, the storm that had pursued us coming back from Smuggler's Island didn't seem to want to leave. Uh, the, uh, the wind was howling in from the sea, uh, rimming uh, my closed eyes with salty Ice. Uh, to take my mind off worrying about Shane's getting back to the castle safely, I, I started thinking again about Oliver's accident. Oh, it seemed odd that there hadn't been any uh, corner posts supporting the gallows trap when they were shown clearly on the in, in the book. Shane might have seen him. But he was uh, a long time coming home. Maybe Oliver's injury was more serious than Dr. Galliano thought. And suddenly, while I worried about these things, visualizing the diagrams and the gallows before part of it collapsed fell, uh, my mind showed me something else. Uh, something I hadn't realized before. Yeah. In the diagrams, those missing four posts had a very important function. Oh, oh, they supported the center of the gallows platform! Exclamation point. Their absence was why the center of the platform collapsed the moment Oliver stepped onto it with his photo taken. Now, oh, there was nothing to hold the center part in the place up here in the air except for a few iron spikes. Uh, add Oliver's weight. Uh, and iron spikes rusted by many years of salt spray would snap like matchsticks. Or, uh, or tear away. And three dots, pow, exclamation point. It had to fall, exclamation point. And Adam's photo would, would prove it, exclamation point. Oh, I was so pleased with my reasoning that I had to tell someone. Mm -hmm. Not in the morning, now, exclamation point. Oh, I got out of bed quickly and into my robe and slippers and the light out of the Lester's room, so I, I went downstairs in the reception room at the big clock over the fireplace, began to chime, and I counted the hours as I descended. Nine, uh, ten, eleven, three dots, midnight, exclamation point. Oh, we went to bed early at Renizzi Castle, but someone had to be up because uh, because the lights were still on. Oh, I hadn't heard Adam come upstairs, and Shane wasn't home yet, and it occurred to me suddenly that the, the Count would have facilities here for developing film. He had taken photos of Yasmin, and if the painting had been done from one, uh, they had to be good. All good amateur photographers preferred to develop their own. <laughs> Adam always had it because of porn. Adam always had at Greenfields where he had his own photography of the horses and porn. Normally, he would develop his uh, present film after he got back, but under the circumstances, uh, he might do it here if the Count had the facilities. I looked into the reception room and then the smaller lounge. The fire still burned and the, the rooms uh, heh, were cozy. But the fires are behind the fire screens now and left to burn low throughout the night. Carla uh, had left coffee percolating in the lounge. Then I said it must be for Shane since nobody else appeared to be around. Shane would enjoy that after his drive from the village and I was tempted to draw a chair close to the fire and wait for him but I couldn't get it out of my mind that Adam Lester was still up and developing his photos somewhere in a dark room hey, but, but, but where? 
There wasn't one of any of these downstairs rooms, and I tried the library even though I'd been there before and probably would have uh, noticed a second door among the walls of the books. I checked. Burp, there was none. The study was a possibility, and I had been distracted by Adam Lester finding the painting, and afterward, I barely looked around the study itself until I hurried out to give Adam the notes. I knocked and waited. Knocked again without reply. The light was still on in there, and I saw as I opened the door, I glanced around guiltily. Ugh, that's bad writing. Before I went inside, I had no right to go in. I knew, but I reminded myself firmly that I intended no harm, and after all, it would only be, uh, it would only take a moment. No way out through Sophia Salta's small office. No doors. I spared the portrait a glance without switching on the light above it and standing near the desk, turned slowly, examining the walls. Ah, a door in the back of the room between bookshelves! Exclamation point. Oh, I hurried triumphantly, but the door, as I opened it, disclosed eh, modern plumbing. Period. A toilet! Exclamation point. I closed it again, deflated. <laughs> Who the hell would put a toilet in this house? <laughs> ah, wherever the dark room was, it did not seem to be off Count Renizzi's study, but the castle Renizzi, it seemed to me, had almost unlimited possibilities for housing a dark room. No more than half the rooms in the great building were in use. Oh, it could be any of the others, and there were the towers for good measure. I started to walk around the desk and stop. Maybe something's finally going to happen in this story. Besides discovering a toilet, which apparently depressed the author, uh, there was something different about the painting, something wrong that I hadn't realized in my search for the dark room, and I stared at it nervously. My feeling of guilt for intr uh, intruding urged me. Uh, to be gone from there quickly before the count saw the light that came in. Uh, but I found myself reaching for the switch down the edge of the desk. Nevertheless, and it clicked, and the light came on with the painting that should have sprung into bright colors, revealing Yasmin's lovely face. Remained a, it remained a deep yellow. I bent forward, frowning at it, while, uh, turn the page because it's not a Kindle, understanding came. The painting had been turned partly away from the wall at an angle toward where I stood. Behind it, the light streamed down uselessly, revealing uh, nothing save the edge of a dark rectangle that four dots. I felt a stirring of fear suddenly, but it was as though the painting drew me into it, and I approached hesitantly, staring. Why was Count Renizzi suddenly moving a portrait that I suspected he had painted only for his eyes to see while he sat behind his desk? Had Adam's newly roused jealousy over Yasmin prompted him to warn the Count away from her? Had they perhaps frightened Count Renizzi into wanting to dispose of the painting? Could Adam Lester scare an arrogant man like the Count? It seemed a shame to me if this was so. The painting, like Yasmin, had great beauty. Such things should be preserved and enjoyed, not destroyed. I stopped abruptly with my hand on the painting. The painting had not, in italics, been turned aside from the wall. It was attached to a partly open door, a door that moved quite easily beneath my hand, as though well oiled. And though the door, uh, through the door, the light from above, I could see at the beginning of a passage that vanished into darkness. Opening the door wide, now I stared inside. My mind accepted at once that I had found the entrance to the dark room I had been searching for. It made sense that it should be adjacent to the Count's study. I had, a, I had more light into the passage and the opening of the door wider, and now I could see that the passage ended 20 feet away, where steps led down, and a faint reddish glow touched the wall above. The, the, the room Count Renizzi used for the dark room must be one of the basement dungeons, like those he had just converted to his Horrid museum of instruments of torture. Well, they they use red light in dark rooms. Uh, that uh, was red light. I could see reflected at the end of the passage. Uh, Adam wouldn't mind if I yeah, walked on him, and, and provided I took the usual precautions. As I'd often had at Greenfields, and Adam Lester was the person I wanted most to tell about my discovery. I had no doubt now that this developed film would prove my theory, but curiosity drove me to check and make sure, and here it seemed to me was my chance. Unless Count Renizzi was down there helping Adam. Eh? Amateur photographers would like that, curious by each other's work. Are they 
I don't really know if that's the case. Uh, so, okay, exclamation point. I walk to the steps and peep down. And if the light was uh, from the dark room, the work must be almost finished. The door open, uh, and if they if they open the dark room door, I might hear their voices or perhaps see whether Adam was alone or not. Uh, once committed, I acted quickly, tiptoeing along short stoned floored passage that remind... I can't turn the page because now they're what? Stuck together? Who masturbates in this book? Reminded me of the passage near the entrance to the Terror Keep. To reassure myself, I told myself firmly that any similarity was uh, purely coincidental. This passage and its steps couldn't possibly lead down to Terror Keep. I reached the top of the steps and stared down anxiously. Yeah, there were more reddish light reflected on the wall below me, but the uh, steps turned there and I could see no farther. I hesitated with my heart pounding heavily and my fear urging me to go back, even though so far I could see or hear nothing to scare me. I began to descend, creeping down a step at a time, poised for flight. At each new step, as my adrenaline juices worked over time, I began to hear a voice, a man's voice. But what it said or who it belonged to, I had no way of knowing. It was a deep voice. It had a threatening note that increased my fear. Someone... Uh, was with Adam Lester. Hey, but who? Oh, that was Cabernese's voice. It sounded more like four dots. Next paragraph. I reached the last step. There was a landing below me. Uh, more stone steps at right angles. Uh, yeah, first flight, and it took me effort to get down there on the landing. Uh, the voice I could hear seemed to be whipping itself in anger. Ah, uh, but the anger was not for me. Whoever that was didn't know I was here. Yeah, we know, because he'd been sneaking and peeping. His anger was for someone else, someone I couldn't see, and uh, to whom he seemed to be giving his full attention. Well, I crept across the landing. Ah, the stone wall turned with the steps, and I peeped around it. Oh, and froze. I was looking into the second chamber of Terror Keep, and there was a figure on the rack. Dressed in the shapeless black garment of Inquisition, a figure with wrists and, and ankles chained to the bars. Standing at the lever that turned the ratchet to force the two bars apart stood a grim figure in the headsman's black leather jacket, hood, and mask. I stared disbelievingly, feeling sick. It was not Adam on the rack, I told myself. It was not anyone at all. It was just a model of a young man with dark hair and a paper white face and open mouth molded in a clever expression of pain uh, and terror and dressed the black robe of the impenitent under torture. But that was uh, all it was, a model. So a mannequin, I guess. Just say mannequin. Just say mannequin. Nothing more. Oh, the tall headsman must be Luigi. <laughs> Play acting, uh, yeah, rehearsing for some new demonstration the kind of plan for us. Uh, the voice spoke again, muffled behind the mask. Oh, you will write as we ask, it said menacingly, and you will do as we ask, or we will kill you. Uh, be sure of that. Uh, it's just a matter of a little more time, uh, a little more pain. Even as I stared disbelievingly, oh, he started pulling the lever, and I heard ratchet wheels click as they locked in newer, tighter grooves. And uh, suddenly, the head of what I thought was a plastic model on the horrible implement uh, began to bend backward. The, uh, the open mouth turned the page on this book someone clearly masturbated in. Christ, these pages are sticky. Right, uh, right, wider. And a hoarse and terrible scream of agony was worn from the living throat behind it. I felt my hair bristle and my flesh creep in horror. My own scream of terror echoed his as I watched his taut limbs stretch visibly, and for a frozen instant, I stared down screaming, while the head of the masked figure torturing him jerked up uh, to seek the source of his newer, unexpected sound. Oh, in the reddish light of his eyes that glared at me through the mask, I uh, had a feral gleam. Then he was coming around the rack toward me, and I was running back up the stone steps, gasping breathless terror as I heard him running after me. Oh, running, I slammed the passage door and its painting shut behind me instinctively, even though when I opened it earlier, uh, there had been no uh, lock on it that I could see. Painting, uh, panting, I ran across the study and out into the passage in unreasoning light. Oh, it never occurred to me to scream for help here, to wake Carla and the maids. 
All I could think was to run from what I had seen, and the sound of that agonized male scream, the sound of my pursuer, stopped when I slammed the passage door. But I did not realize it, and the only place I knew to run to seemed to be my bedroom. There was a bolt on the inside of the bedroom door, and I was safe in there. I turned at the stairs and was running up with my chest feeling as though it might uh, burst. And I reached the next floor and turned into the familiar passage with my legs weakening from fear and exertion. Yasmin's room was still dark. And I ran past her closed door, sobbing as I fought for breath. My bedroom door was close now, near where the passage turned, going back toward the front of the building. I had almost uh, reached my door when I sensed movement ahead. Suddenly, someone was coming swiftly around the corner to bar my way. Too late! Uh, I reacted to this new menace as I recognized that the black cloth figure with its leather hood and mask, his uh, cruel eyes gleaming in the dim night lights of the passage as he reached with muscular hands to seize me and stifle my cries. I turned, crying out of terror, as his strong hands seized the helm of my flying robe and dragged me backwards towards him. Oh, I lost, uh, lost both slippers as I fought to free myself, but somehow you had slippers on this whole time? And somehow I writhed out of my robe. Uh, leaving it empty in his hands. But I was running naked, screaming back to the stairs again. I heard Yasmin, rudely awakened, cry out in fright as I passed her door, but my attacker was too close behind me for uh, me to attempt to enter. I reached the stairs and started down as someone closing the front door behind him turned the page of this masturbatory book. Apparently someone really enjoyed this part of the book. Froze in astonishment, staring up at me from the entrance. Shane! I screamed. Eh, eh. Help me, Shane. I saw them torturing someone down there, and they came after me. Uh, help me. Oh, uh, uh, Megan, uh, uh, what is it? What's the matter? He started toward me anxiously. Well, with that, why don't we take a little break, because this reminds me of a uh, fun little story about uh, Dorglass Incorporated. Stephen Dorglass, uh, failed... Uh, male model, because he's got small legs, beautiful, beautiful upper body, and long, flowing blonde hair. But legs like little cigarettes. Uh, he moved on in his life after failing at other venues, uh, and uh, he spent time working as a, a, a private eye. I'm going with that. So he worked as a private eye, and he was trying to solve a case uh, of a, 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 a man who's been married nine times, and all of his wives have died. So he's trying to solve that case, and suddenly he came onto a clue that the uh, the man who has murdered all of his wives uh, they noticed, uh, hey, you, you found that, this pearl earring. I'm not going to get into the details of this. But anyways, he goes, Stephen Dorglas, you know too much. So he started to chase Stephen Dorglas. And Stephen Dorglas, at this point, not having any real direction in his life except for his new career as a uh, private detective, uh, ran from this murderer, eh, accused, accused murderer, ran from him. It ran across the estates, much like this book, running through open fields till he finally got to the greenhouse. The greenhouse made of perfect, solid walls, of perfectly transparent and clean glass. He hid behind it, uh, realizing I'm not really hiding from anything. I'm just standing here in the middle of this giant glass house, and that guy's coming right at me. But the thing that he didn't realize at the time was that glass is invisible. This guy was running straight at him and smacked into the glass, fell backwards, uh, and died of a concussion. And Stephen Dorglas realized, I could harness the power of this invisible wall and I could make a entire career out of it. And boy, did he. He started Dorglass Incorporated. That's D-O-R-G-L-A-S-S dot com. They're dedicated to fabricating and professionally installing the highest quality glass products from the nation's top manufacturers. Their inventory, combined with years of experience, makes them the premier source for installation and repair. They approach every project with the same goals. Professionalism, integrity, and most importantly, if you're trying to create some sort of invisible wall to keep attackers away from you, especially if you've got like a panic room or something like that, or you just got a room where you keep all your porn, and you don't want anyone actually getting at it, even if you want them to see it, and they'll smack into it and die of a concussion, they're discreet. What do they do? Commercial storefronts, automatic entrances, windows, patio doors, mirrors, shower doors, installation repair, and they'll design and build any goddamn invisible wall you want. Uh, their clients, Pottery Barn, 
Williams Sonoma, Sherman Williams, Portillo's, which is a sandwich shop no one cares about, the Salt Cave, which is a store in Minneapolis that's in part of some sort of weird little wannabe strip mall, a strip mall of just two buildings. Uh, it looks gross. I've driven past it before. Uh, they have uh, walls in there made of Himalayan salt, and they light it from behind, so you walk into a room where just the walls are glowing. The walls are glowing like you're some sort of uh, ancient mystical hut. And uh, you can... Do all sorts of dumb shit in there, like yoga, and uh, hot yoga, and uh, meditate, or maybe just have a book club. I think they actually have a book club, if I remember correctly. But the thing is, you sit in this dumb room where they claim that it does things like cure cancer and stuff that you can't prove and uh, also don't need to prove it because it's not true. Uh, but the thing is, they say on their website, don't touch the walls. Whatever the hell you do, don't touch the goddamn walls. If you touch the walls, they're going to call the Minneapolis police on you, and that's terrifying. So uh, with that, they also have Applebee's. Well, that got me worked into a lather. I'm feeling kind of frothy. Why don't we uh, retire up to the master bedroom and spread out on my silken sheets of my heart-shaped bed uh, as uh, we learn about the newest upcoming romance novels from Penguin Random House Books. All right, I'm coming. Always keeping my hopes up that this time something success... Uh, the hell are you? You're just sitting there with a giant 1970s huge plastic rim glasses and a sweater that says I love dogs with a big heart instead of the word love. That's creative. And you're holding some kind of stuffed animal dog and a pair of scissors and you're just sitting there cutting all the hair off this stuffed animal dog. Why? That's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Oh, you're pointing towards a book. Here on the silken sheets of my bed that's now covered with fake dog hair, uh, The Love Connection by Denise Williams. About The Love Connection, an airport pet groom. Oh, an airport pet groomer. Okay, I'm surprised you didn't wear like a little captain's hat while you were wearing that outfit. I think I say I'm a little bit disappointed. Meets her frequent flyer crush in this captivating romance novella from the uh, acclaim novella from the acclaimed author of How to Fail at Flirting. Well, at least they're not a New York Times best-selling author, so that's nice. Uh, guess you can't get that when you just have a novella. Even New York Times best-selling whatever that you pay $40 to. They're like, nah, it's just a novella. We can't put you on the list. Make it longer. Ollie Wright loves the thrill of taking chances, like opening a pet grooming salon in an airport. Why? How many people are bringing their pets on the airplane that they got to get groomed first? Where every day is a little unpredictable. This is already the dumbest story I've ever heard in my entire life. The one thing she won't risk is her heart. So, catching glimpses of a cute stranger from afar is enough romantic entanglement for her. Hmm. Bennett Barker, dumb name, is a professional risk assessor, dumb career, by day while writing popular romance novels at night. Completely unrealistic, except he finds himself facing writer's block. His life of carefully planned stability comes crashing down when he rescues a slippery pup hmm, in the airport and returns it to the enchanting pet groomer whose laugh... Uh, inspires him to start writing again. This is horrible. Their chance encounter and instant chemistry thrusts, oh, that's a sexual word, them into a whirlwind of airport dates and pretzel kiosks. Stolen glances at empty gates and late night texts leave them swooning. If the risk averse Bennett can uh, take a chance on uncertainty and adventurous Ollie will break her own rule. Their friendship might stop taxiing and finally take off? Ugh. No reviews for this. It's only a novella. There's only so much you can do for someone that only puts in half the work, half-hearted effort. The Love Connection by Denise Williams. Uh, it's an e-book, of course, because novella, uh, <laughs> which comes out on May 17th, 2022. I don't really hate novellas this much. I'm just having fun. Can I have some fun? It's my fucking podcast. May 17th, 2022. From Amazon, Apple Books, Barnes & Noble, Books a million, the Google Play Store, and Kobo. <laughs> I got nothing to work here with, Denise. You're making me do all the work here. Well, with that turd fest, uh, I don't know. I don't feel aroused at all. Plus, you look like one of my mom's friends uh, from the 80s, and I cannot get hard. So, with that, why don't we uh, go back down to the library and finish reading this ridiculous story?
Now oh, you finally made it back down here. Uh, and you brought the stuffed animal. It's hairless. You spent the entire time I did that review shaving all the rest of its hair off, and now you brought this naked, just cloth dog down here. Why? Why did you bring it? Seeing Shane, I forgot the stairs and the length of the long nylon nightdress that was the only garment my attacker had left me. I felt my toes catch in its hem. Oh, and I was falling down the stairs. I heard Shane's voice, sharpened by fear for me, uh, uh, and cry out, uh, Megan! And then my head struck the base of the balustrade with a shocking force, and there was nothing. Four dots. I wakened to daylight. Then a throbbing headache, and I stared around disbelievingly. Moments ago, it seemed it had been a little after midnight, and I had been lying on the stairs with Shane rushing to help me. But uh, here it was, the middle of the day, and I, burp, was in bed in my room. Gasmin and Count Renizzi's private secretary, Sophia Salta, were uh, sitting at the small table near my window, sipping coffee and talking in low voices. Uh, studying them, I decided that they did not seem very worried about me. Uh, in fact, they were quite callously unconcerned! Exclamation point. I deserve more sympathy than that after what I'd been through last night, I decided. But maybe I hadn't told them before I passed out. I had retained a vague memory of people around me, uh, voices arguing, uh, Shane's among them, but that was last night. It seemed to have lost last night, uh, this morning, and four dots that weirdly have more spaces between them than the other dots. That's weird. He's really using these dots as a way of communicating to us pregnant pauses. It was all too much for me. I groaned in self-pity, and they both looked across the room at me and put down their coffee cups. Ah, the senorita is awake, Sophia said unnecessarily. Uh, at about time, too, Yasmin said, but she got up, came over to smile at me. How do you feel, uh, Megan? You gave us all a fright last night, yeah. You silly girl. Well, I feel awful, I admitted, and I put a hand up to my head uh, and found a lump there and winced. I think... I have a concussion. My head is aching terribly, and I have a horrible taste in my mouth. That's a weird little twist. Well, that must have been some nightmare you had. Yasmin smiled. Uh, you had the whole castle awake and in an uproar. Uh, then you tumbled downstairs at poor Shane's feet for good measure. She giggled and <laughs> gave my shoulder an affectionate pat, 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 pat. Adam and I just can't believe our quiet little begging creates such a turmoil over nothing. All right, uh... Over, uh, over nothing, I said, sitting up indignantly. My head throbbed so violently at the movement that I had to close my eyes and put up both hands to hold on. Ouch! Uh, exclamation point. How do you, how do you suppose I got this, Yasmin? I demanded. Well, now don't get upset, darling, she urged. You fell downstairs and hit your head. Adam thinks you were sleepwalking, but I can't accept that. I mean, uh, you've never had that kind of trouble since you've lived with us, and I've never heard you mention it happening to you before that. Uh, it never did, uh, and it has it now. I nodded complacently. That's what I said. You weren't sleepwalking. Uh, you had this dream. What dream, darling? She said. I'm only trying to answer your question. The dream you were trying to tell Shane about just before you fell. Of course. Uh, and don't tell me you've forgotten the cause of all this trouble. You must have been. Uh, you must have been quite convincing too, because Shane, Kate, Shane went rushing off as soon as he could to check, and Adam with him. Shane said you were screaming about something uh, being tortured downstairs. Uh, and how you uh, saw this happening, and the uh, torturer uh, chased you. Uh, as I said before, it was some dream you had, Megan. Some dream. It was seeing my brother Luigi working with models down there, Sophia said, bringing me, me coffee with the percolator on the table that they've been sitting. Uh, the way Luigi uh, presents it, the way it might have been in life. I will not look at such things myself, or perhaps I too might have the nightmares about them, uh, and rush screaming down the stairs. Luigi was working with a model last night. Is that what you want me to believe, Sophia? I demanded angrily. Do models scream? And she smiled uneasily. I did not mean last night, senorita. I meant uh, the evening you all went down there together. Uh, that was what you uh, made you dream. Uh, it would have been impossible for anyone to see anything in the dungeons last night. Both my brother and my cousin, uh, Niccolo, were in the village. Niccolo had been there all day, and my brother joined him when the yacht returned from Smuggler's Island. 
She shook her head affectionately. Eh, neither of the brutes came home last night. They drove in this morning while we were sitting here waiting for you to awake. She, told, she looked at Yasmin, and Yasmin looked in the green. That's right, Megan. Last night when Shane went rushing down the, uh, to the, the dungeons, uh, they were in darkness. And she broke off smiling. Here's Shane now. Shane, uh, tell Megan about you checking the dungeons with Adam last night uh, after you carried her upstairs. I remembered the thin nylon nightdress I'd worn last night and was still wearing. I felt myself flush as I looked at him. You carried me upstairs, Shane? Oh, 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 he hit a grin. And after I examined you for uh, possible injuries, <laughs> of course, Megan, he said innocently. Luckily, all you had was a lump on the side of your head, uh, the one you still have, I notice. Otherwise, I thought you were dot, 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 perfect. Eh, don't thank me for carrying up to bed. Eh, it was no hardship, I assure you. Just call on me any time at all. Shane, you're embarrassing Megan, his aunt said sternly. Be serious. Tell her what happened after she fell at your feet on the stairs. Okay, he said solemnly. I'm serious. You frightened the hell out of me last night. Megan, uh, I thought you'd killed yourself. And I believe you had seen something that scared the living daylights out of you and that you had been chased. I believed it because it was uh, the way you looked when you ran off the top of the stairs and yelled to me for help. Uh, you were terrified. The way you yelled uh, brought uh, people running from everywhere. All kinds of people. What, like strangers no one knew about? Like a, a guy in a safari and... Uh, and, and maybe like a, a fishmonger. Uh, Uncle Adam, Yasmin, Dominic, Carla, Sophia, the chauffeur, and a couple of gardeners. <laughs> About the only ones missing were Count Petro, Luigi, and Niccolo. I was just uh, telling the Signora that uh, Luigi and Niccolo uh, stayed in the village last night, Signor. Sophia said, there was a chance, or there was a dance at night, a social evening following the meeting of the village council, which the count was in present. The, the count was there, and he left to attend. This is all really boring. Meeting immediately after dinner last night and stayed very late, as he often does. So I've heard, Shane said dryly, glancing at me with a half smile. Sophia got up. I'm glad you are better, Signora, and I must go now, and we will have reports from the meeting for me. Uh, where was uh, your uncle when I fell, Shane? I asked impatiently when she had left us. Well, like everyone else, in bed, Shane said. He jumped up so fast and grabbed Yasmin's robe instead of his own. Oh, oh, that was something to see. Ah, we were both fast asleep, Yasmin said resentfully. He nodded. As soon as I was sure that you were okay, Megan, I told Adam that you had... Uh, you said what happened. Sophia got the key for us from the study and went down to the terror keep with flashlights. The place was locked and in complete darkness. We switched on the light and checked, but everything was under wraps. There was someone down there wearing Luigi's headsman gear. And I said, uh, I saw him. And he, he had a man fastened on the rack and he pulled the lever to the side uh, the way Luigi told us how it works. And the man, the horrible thing, was nearly torn apart. He screamed uh, and so did I. Uh, that's when the person in Luigi's gear saw me and chased me, and I tried to get to my room, but he was waiting for me at the corner. Turn the page. Oh, it's less sticky now, so this must not be as uh, erotic for the last reader. Uh, he grabbed my robe, but it came off, and that's when I ran to the stairs and saw you. She dreamed it, Shane, Yasmin said sympathetically. I did not. Look, I was lying in bed thinking about Oliver's accident. I know just how it happened. Four posts are missing. They're shown on the diagram of the book the Count told us all about. And they uh, have been taken away or uh, rotted away, and that's when the platform fell. I wanted to tell Adam, so, that, so I went downstairs looking for him, and I thought it would be uh, developing the photos, and I saw that I saw him taken. I, I knew that they must prove I was right, and I thought about the Count. It must have been in the dark room someplace, and Adam would be working there. You went looking for Adam? In just that nightgown? Yasmin said suspiciously. Just as well. Uh, he was already in bed. I had my robe on. I thought the dark room might be off uh, Count Bernese's study. I looked in there, and I noticed something odd about the painting you and I talked about. Yasmin, it's attached to the door that's partly open, and I looked in and saw a passage and a faint red glow of light. Oh, I was sure I found the dark room, and there were steps leading down, and I turned the landing and saw this man on the rack, uh, and all those awful things began happening to me. 
It had all been too much for me, and I realized suddenly, and now their belief, their disbelief, was the last straw. I was crying, and they were both trying to comfort me at once. Nah, it's all right, honey, Yasmin was nurturing. Look, it's uh, it's all right. Everyone dreams, and sometimes you can't tell they are dreams. Uh, they seem so real. Well, this is now dream, I sobbed. Uh, where's my robe? I'll bet he tore it. Uh, I turned to run outside my door, and he caught me by the, by the hem of my robe and dragged me backwards. He, dot, 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 exclamation point, uh, end quote, I'll get the robe for you, honey, Yasmin said soothingly. I put it away last night when you were safely in bed, but darling, there can't be anything wrong with the robe or I would have noticed. You weren't wearing it, you know, or slippers, just your nightdress. Your robe was folded at the foot of your bed and the slippers were on the floor uh, side by side, the way you left them when you went to sleep before you started dreaming. Yeah, I stared at her through my tears. That's impossible. I wear the robe and slippers came off in the passage. Megan! I know where I found them, she said impatiently. The robe was folded on the bed. The slippers were side by side at the foot of the bed. And the way you always leave them uh, at night at Greenfields. Oh, boy. Maybe that part was exciting for the last reader. Because, boy, that was, that was a tough one. Then someone saw them outside and brought them in for me. Well, she shook her head and went to find the robe, and I whispered desperately, Shane, Shane, you've got to believe me. Oh, I know. You believe what you're saying, Megan, he muttered. And I know you're not making it up. Making it up? I could have hit him. Well, there you are, Megan, yes, but said with an edge of triumph, uh, turning, uh, turning the robe for my inspection. You see, uh, not a mark. Oh, look at the hem. Uh, oh, at the back of the robe. See, perfectly straight, isn't it? I took it from Yasmin and examined it. Suspiciously, turning the ham about disbelievingly, and it was unmarked. Oh, there's no sign of stretching. I stared at it dumbly while Yasmin watched sympathetically. Oh, oh, I know what happened, I whispered. Yeah, better face it, and you'll feel better, Megan, Yasmin said. Uh, you had a bad dream. You woke in terror, perhaps only partly awakened, and you jumped out of bed uh, the way you were in your nightdress. No robe. No slippers. Oh, you ran down the stairs and saw Shane coming in and, and, and called to him. Then you fell, Shane. Uh, was it exactly that, Megan said? He frowned. Uh, the exact words? Uh, Shane, help me. Shane, I think. Uh, and uh, she was obviously terrified. I thought, uh, hysterical. Have you ever known me uh, to be a hysterical Yasmin? I asked her. Oh, she shook her head. No, Megan, I haven't. I often wished I had your calm. Hmm. But there can always be a first time, can't there, Shane? When so, why don't you turn to Shane about this? When someone else experiences a particularly vivid nightmare? Oh, oh, it can happen, says Shane, a master of all things psychology. Uh, the rest of what she said was, I saw them torturing someone down there, and they came after me. Help me, Shane. That was all, she said. Yasmin asked him. That was all. I asked her uh, what the matter, and she started to, uh, to move toward her, and then, she, and then she fell. That man was close behind me, Shane. You must have seen him. He shook his head. Megan, all I saw was you. And Uncle Adam got there almost as soon as I did. He didn't see anyone in the passage either, or your robe or slippers lying in the passage. Uh, he would have turned toward the stairs where the action was. It perhaps, he studied me, frowning slightly. Uh, what you said about a secret door behind the painting in the study, though, now that's something that wouldn't vanish like your dream with your uh, waking. If I check that out and there's no door, no passage leaning down to it, terror keep where you can see the, uh, the rack from the steps. Uh, will you believe that you dream this thing? The door will still be there, and the passage, of course. Why didn't I think of that? All I had to do is ask Sophia about it, and she said that she was gonna, uh, going to work. And if she doesn't know, I'll try the door myself. I'm sure Pedro won't mind. It won't be long. I'm coming with you, he frowned. I'm not sure uh, you should have any excitement just yet, Megan. I don't care what you think. I know what happened, and I'm going to prove it, uh, it that it did happen. I'm coming with you, Shane, I told him grimly, now in italics. I'd uh, sooner you rested a while, Megan, he said. If it was there, your passage isn't going to run away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you better wait downstairs, Shane, his aunt said uh, when I stayed grimly silent, and I'll help her dress. Megan can be stubborn when she likes. Now, I noticed that. <laughs> yes, Shane said as he left us reluctantly. Well, that's the end of that chapter. 
Uh, for Christ's sake. Well, at least something finally happened. Why don't we, uh, instead of complaining about it now, go down to the smoking room. We can view, uh, review what the hell we just read. Well, here we are, down in the smoking room, where my girlfriend decided it would be a nice addition to have a parakeet sound effect uh, here for us to enjoy. What did we learn in this chapter? Let's uh, actually do a recap. Basically, uh, what, Megan? I don't even care anymore. She uh, she had a big idea about why the platform fell and uh, decided to go find someone to tell it. And um, that's pretty exciting. She couldn't wait till the morning. So she thinks uh, one of the guys is a photographer and he's going to be up all night uh, developing his photos, his upskirt photos. So she starts looking around. She finally finds that there's the painting has been moved away from the wall and there's a secret door behind it and goes down in there and sees someone on the rack being stretched out and tortured, wearing, for some weird reason, uh, a mannequin's mask or something, And but there's actually a person behind it screaming and uh, just looking around. So uh, she freaks out, runs away, and then uh, everyone you know, sees her fall down the stairs and make an ass out of herself, and then uh, no one believes her. They all think she had a bad dream. So that's the recap. What's good? Well, something finally happened. Is it terrifying? Eh, I mean, I guess finally something scary happened. I'm not personally scared. And I'm actually, for real, in a basement. I should be more terrified or more uh, sensitive to scary stories than I normally would be in a brightly lit living room. But uh, not scared, so it's not that scary. But uh, what sucks? It's not that scary. I'm really hoping in the next, what, three chapters that something finally freaking happens. Like, gets real exciting happening. There's a picture on the cover of this book of a woman in a beautiful flowing dress running away from a, a darkened castle. So I'm expecting that to happen at some point. Or that's also just kind of the cover of all these books written in the 70s. Uh, what do we learn? Uh... I don't know. Mind your own business. If you're staying in somebody else's, uh, else's house, don't go wandering around digging in their shit. If I had someone staying here uh, for any reason, and they just kind of got up, started digging through my stuff, uh, started like looking through my diary that I had when I was 12 years old, uh, I'd probably be pretty pissed off. So if I wanted to torture animals or something in my basement, and they discovered me doing it, who's the bigger offender? The person uh, torturing animals? Or the person who's snooping around discovering that you're torturing animals. Uh, I think it's the latter. Well, with that, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, I will see you next week. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people, not losers. So if you're cool... Uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. We can see a backlog of everything I've ever read, uh, along with episodes from Book Boys and uh, blah, blah, blah. You can also find me on Instagram, uh, which is uh, House Nuzzle. And conveniently enough, uh, Twitter, which is also at House Nuzzle. Annoyingly, YouTube made me pick a name instead of just a house nuzzle. So I got Glenn Nuzzles. So I guess you search for that if you want to watch a screen that doesn't do anything and just hear my voice. Uh, and since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's got to be one left. <laughs>